Dr. Padhai today, whose 145th birthday has just been observed our Bengali department early this evening. And to move on, I would ask heartily our principal sir to deliver his welcome speech. Our sir, Dr. Chitranjan Dash, is our true pioneer. He is the source of all our inspirations. It is by his repeated motivation that we, the Department of English, have been inspired to organize such a webinar on the topic today. And without enlarging my general talk, I would request you, sir, to please deliver your welcome piece. So over to you, sir, Dr. Chitranjan Dash. Sir, please. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I just want to know our uh, resource person, Dr. Sukant Dasi, in which name he has joined? He, in Sukant, in which name yes, he has sir. joined? I can find his Shukanto, name in this please, list. Would you please? Uh, hello, good yeah, evening, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay, okay. Very good evening, very good evening. Thank you. Good okay, okay. So, good evening, everybody. And uh, I congratulate and welcome our resource person, Dr. Sukanto Das, Associate Professor, Department of English. Uh, I also put my heartfelt thanks to the Department of English of our college uh, to organize this webinar today. It is a great pleasure. We are uh, just uh, above our departmental head just told that uh, today we have had another program. We had uh, we have observed the but the 145th birthday of Sarat Chandra Chattopadhyay, a Bengali novelist. Today the program was over just at 6.30, then the Department of English program, two coveted languages, English language and Bengali language. The last program was in Bengali, that this is in English. So I uh, here I welcome our resource person, all the dignitaries, of the, of the teachers of different departments of our college, students of our college, and if students from, from other colleges are present here, they are also welcome to our college. Our IQAC coordinators, I don't have the list who are present here. So all the teachers of our college, the teachers from any adjacent college or any other college organization, if they are present, I heartily welcome you all to our college, to this webinar, which is going to be uh, addressed by our resource person, Dr. Sukant Das. It's a great pleasure to be here and welcome Mr. Das to this webinar. Uh, it is problematizing reading on in corners a heart of darkness i think this topic is in the fifth semester of our uh, cbc structure as told by adhi babu i don't have any idea he told me that this topic is in the fifth semester of cbc structure english department the topic is very much textual uh, for the english department of the honor students of the english department so i don't have any knowledge even I don't have any audacity to go into this topic. My heart is in dark. It is totally in darkness to say something on this topic. I just want to welcome everyone, especially the students of this very department, to be very much attentive and to put and I and I request them to put their concentration on the topic, which is going to be delivered by our honorable resource person and make sure that you will be benefited by the topic, by the contents put before you. And before leaving this webinar, make sure that you are enriched 
and your topic under your syllabus is very much is under your control. So making sure, I hope you will leave this webinar. This is uh, totally not a common topic. It is purely a special topic, it's a textual topic, a specific topic. So it is for you, all our students. So make sure that it is for you and you enjoy it and put your concentration on the topic, uh, put your pen and paper uh, to get the notes of the topic if you want, if you have, have any queries, put in your note and ask after the uh, session, is called, after the uh, lecture is delivered. So there may be, I hope uh, Adhir Babu has, our the team has uh, uh, earmarked a session for questionnaire, the, the interactive session. If the students have any question, they can put the question before our research person to get them answered. So all our teachers are here also, the department, uh, the teachers from English department, teachers from other departments are also. I hope they will have a good evening, a very good uh, session ahead. And I, I, I also request our uh, support team and uh, the, the students to mute their mic and uh, to mute their videos, uh, to, let the, our, to let our resource person to concentrate on his lecture, if he can share something uh, so he, can, he will have the liberty to share, so don't uh, disturb him, don't, don't uh, unmute your mic, don't unmute your video. And uh, this digital uh, support team, I think Chandan Babu and Kausik, uh, make sure that uh, no students uh, unmute uh, to uh, get any uh, research and get disturbed by this. So uh, I just, uh, just want, don't want to enlarge my topic, uh, enlarge my welcome address. I again welcome everyone, everyone and I also welcome our resource person and I hope we will have an enjoying session ahead. Thank you, everyone. Oh, it is your it's host, Adhir Babu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, our honorable yes, principal. For your valuable speech, your consecutive motivation inspires us to do something for the betterment of our students and the, and the institution as well. Sir, you are our true pioneer. Thank you again, sir, for being with us. Now, I would like to invite Professor Adhi Roy, head of the Department of English of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Shatobarshiki Mohavitaloy to deliver introduction on the topic, Problematizing Reading in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Rakesh. To start with, as I uh, addressed our Honorable Principal, sir, Dr. Chitranjan Dash, present our Honorable Speaker today, Dr. Shukanto Dash, our IQC Coordinator, Dr. Atha Mullik, other dignitaries, other students, scholars, and teachers from all departments and other institutions as well. As I started, I would just uh, address you once again as friend. Dear friends, you all know that we're passing through a tough time in our domestic, social, and academic sphere in global level. And it is due to the outbreak of global pandemic, that is Corona, which is caused by COVID-19. The very pandemic has almost paralyzed us almost in every sphere. But friends, if the pandemic is fearful, man is fearless. He always finds some substitute way. And here also, we find some substitute way. That is, in place of seminar, we have been here assembled to organize our webinar. You know, uh, Dr. Shukanto Dash will give us new direction, new horizon, new light, and uh, of course, a new uh, realm of thought on his topic, problematizing reading in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Dr. Shukanto Dash has been teaching English literature and language at undergraduate level from November 1, 2003. Initially, he was involved in North Bengal University, that is P.D. Women's College, Jalpaiguri. He obtained his doctoral degree from the University of Bardwan under the guidance of Shukriti Babu, who has recently been awarded with the Shikha Ratna Award. Just a weeks ago. 
and Dr. Shukanto Das completed his PhD in 2014, right? And for his uh, the topic, I, the topic for his uh, thesis was contextualizing identity in Amitabh Ghosh's novel. He published a number of research papers in various reputed journals and and edited a book named Border Globalization and Identity, published from Cambridge Scholars Publishing, UK. He presented papers at various national and international seminars and conferences held at USA, Germany, and other places as well. He is interested in the issues of identity, border, migration, etc. He is currently teaching at Prashanta Chandra Mahalanabish Mahavidyalaya, Bon Hookli, Kolkata, as an assistant professor, sorry, as an associate professor. Dear friends, uh, before going to before going to the nucleus of our topic tonight, I would just concentrate at another point. You know, it will be the sorry, Tonmoy, please mute your please Tonmoy, Tonmoy, please mute. Tonmoy, please. Thank you. Actually, sir, multiple approaches can be applied to explain, to render, to assert the real subject matter, meaning and impact of a successful novel like Heart of Darkness. Here in this regard, there comes the relevance of problematizing reading of the very book. So let us listen to Dr. Dash to get a new dimension, as I mentioned, new horizon and new light from our today's speaker, Dr. Shukanto Dash. And one thing more before start, uh, the participants are heartily requested to submit, it, to submit their feedback forms immediately after the interaction session, when Rakesh Babu will be giving the vote of thanks. You are heartily requested to submit your feedback forms so that we can deliver your participation certificate immediately after the session. And with this note, I would conclude. Rather, I would welcome Dr. Shukanto Das. Please, over to you, Sir Shukanto Das. Well, uh, thank you, Adhir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, now, I take this opportunity to uh, thank and uh, express my gratefulness to the principal of the college, that is Dr. E.R. Das of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Satovarsiki Mohavidyalaya, Dr. Atta Mullik, the coordinator of IQAC of the college, my friend, of, my friend Mr. Adhi Rai, assistant professor of English of this college, and the other teachers and staff of the college. Now, my participants and dear students of that college and other colleges as well. Well, um, before I start, let me just make one or two uh, points clear, particularly the, you know, let me confess one thing that is, I'll be primarily addressing my students, I mean, the undergraduate students, because it is for them, uh, you know, this webinar has been organized in that sense. And this text is prescribed in the UGC, you know, formulated uh, CDCS course uh, in the fifth semester in all the universities, uh, most likely. And I don't consider myself competent enough to address the research scholars and others. So therefore, if my talk appears to be too, you know, obvious, so I rather crave your indulgence. And what I have planned to do here is to try to set 
you know, talk about this text, um, Heart of Darkness, so that the students can approach it and how to approach the text, all these things quite, you know, I would say ordinary approaches perhaps, but necessary things. This is what I will be trying to talk about. And one thing that Adhir has said a little earlier to, you know, he said light or the enlightened. Now that is something very interesting, particularly in the context of uh, today's, uh, you know, talk, because we are going to talk about heart of darkness. It's primarily about darkness, about the heart of darkness. So light will obviously play a significant role, the necessary, uh, you know, importance of light, etc. And interestingly, this timing is also very, you know, interesting and curious. It is after, you know, the evening. So light will be really necessary. But this, how this light has been used in our life, we'll be trying to talk about that. Now, what I will what I have planned to do is to present certain slides and to try to talk about these things. So I'll be presenting and I hope that it will be visible to you. Let me just check it. Uh, let me just... Uh, is the screen shared there? Can you see it? Hopefully. Is it OK? Yes. OK. Okay, yes, sir. okay, okay, thank you. So the title of my talk is Problematizing Reading in Honor's Heart of Darkness. Now, Heart of Darkness, as we all know, is a very, uh, I would say, popular text, well-known text, is a crucial text, and it has been read by the students of English literature. Uh, normally at the postgraduate level and now at the undergraduate level as well. Uh, anyway, so it's a very popular text. Uh, it's a very canonical text as well. We'll come to that a little later. So the title is Problematizing Reading in Founded Sort of Darkness. What I am trying to say, or what I shall be trying to say here, is that we'll be approaching Heart of Darkness, but my focus will be here, as I have said, I'll be trying to, you know, student friendly, trying to talk about, uh, you know, certain things that the students may, uh, you know, tap in order to, you know, approach the text. So therefore, my focus here is uh, reading, to read the text, but uh, how to read it. So here I'll be trying to problematize the reading. So let's move on. Now you see, when you talk about the any text, the point is we have to make reading, but how to read, what to read, these are the questions that actually come to our mind. One is, first of all, what to read. That is obviously here in this case, hard of dog. And then again, is is it the text that we need to read or what should come before that? Is it the context? Is it the author's biography? Is it the author's views in correspondence, in letters, in other, uh, you know, notes and all that? So we need to read these things. So text, on the one hand, you have to read the text. On the other hand, the context, the author's biography, author's views, or other, uh, you know, contextual uh, you know, documents or references, etc. This is this constitutes what what to read, and then comes the point how to read the text. 
meaning I'm addressing to the students how you will have to read the text, I will be reading the text. So, for example, when you are reading the text, you have to unravel the plot, what is this plot, how to unravel it, then decode the message that the author is trying to, you know, communicate, unfolding the narrative strategy in the case of a novel, a fiction, you have to unfold the narrative strategy that has been uh, you know, uh, adopted by the writer. And then comes the other sorts of reading, reading against the grain or contrapuntal reading. Uh, this is the term that was used by Edward Said. I'll come to it later. So when you take up a text, Heart of Darkness, so uh, there are certain things that we need to uh, understand. First, obviously, we have to keep on reading the text as it is. Along with this textual reading, we need to read the other things, the context, the author's biography, author's views, etc. And the plot, uh, meaning when you'll be reading it, there is a story, there is a plot. These are the common things that the students of literature are all familiar with. They have to know what's, you know, a story is, what plot is, how to decode the masses, because the masses is actually hidden under the layer of the different under different layers uh, that have been actually presented in different forms so these are the things but again this is a part of the traditional reading this is a part of a very traditional reading but when you will be reading a text uh, as rich as heart of darkness or other texts uh, then we have to use a certain other strategy to read it not just the kind of uh, you know traditional reading will help us to uh, to get at the possible, uh, you know, interpretations of that text. Okay. Now, the issue, you know, relating to the title that I have actually selected, that here, why to problematize reading? I mean, what is the point of adopting the different strategies of reading a text? Because <coughs> We have to explore the possible readings of a text. Possible readings, because not the traditional reading will actually yield the desired result. Okay, so and as we all know that when you read a text, a kind of uh, you know traditional dominant reading comes up. So that is one point, one uh, focus of uh, you know exploring the text. But then again comes other things to explore the possibility of any other readings that require reading against the grain. Meaning that does not conform to the traditional way of reading the text. Meaning we have to then move beyond the obvious, move beyond the obvious, maybe beyond what the author has been trying to say. There has been so many things, author is dead and all that. I'm not going into all these uh, you know, jargon and terms right now. The point I'm trying to make here is that we have to therefore be conscious about the possibility of different kinds of reading uh, that a text can offer. And our job, the job of a student or a critic is to see the uh, probable ways of, of, you know, focusing the text of unraveling the text. So this is where comes the problematization. Okay. Now, those who are acquainted with the story, uh, it's okay. Those who don't have, I'm just, uh, you know, trying to refer to a little bit of uh, a storyline in sketch, that in search of a story in Heart of Darkness. Now the story is very simple. In a very, <coughs> sorry. Very, very simple, straightforward in that sense. And the, na one narrative point, Marlow is the narrator, though I'll be talking about this narrative aspect a little later. Marlow is, an, is on an expedition to Africa, though that is not mentioned in the text, but we know it from the other, from other references, is on an expedition to Africa to meet and retrieve curse an agent of the company that he uh, works for, 
and Kurt has been an ivory merchant there, quite popular, famous, and also much, uh, you know, uh, frightened of. Now, narrates his experience during the journey. Mayor Sports tries to convince him to return back, but when Marlowe meets Kurtz, he, you know, Kurtz was in a very declining state physically. He was in poor health. And after, you know, meeting Marlowe and Kurtz gives hands over certain documents and dies. Marlowe then, after that, returns back to Europe, meets Kurtz intended, that is his fiance, and tells a lie. What kind of lie? We'll talk about that. So this is in a nutshell the story, and while undertaking the journey up front uh, to meet Kurt, we see that Marlowe, uh, you know, narrates his experience, what he sees all around, what he finds, uh, the treatment of the, uh, you know, African, hey, the poor no, Africans, no, 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 no. by the Africans, by the, you know, whites, and the kind of exploitation, the kind of, you know, uh, I would say, uh, the kind of, you know, conspiracy hatched by the white traders there. We'll talk about this later. And also certain other things, the deep jungle, through which he has to make the journey and all that. So all these are actual narratives. So this is primarily the kind of story. Now, what we need to do now when we know this story that you have read the text they will uh, be better familiar with the whole thing and i will be trying to explain that now the thing is that uh yes that is reading matters because this is where now comes the way the critical way we can actually or the critical you know, focus that you need to uh, understand the possible uh, interpretations, the possible meanings, the message of the text. So how to read that text, the, the kind of story that is, you know, uh, in the very text, how to read it? Reading the novel, I mean, can you read the novel as an adventure story of the uh, European moving to the jungle and to that, a uh, place um, made skirts, uh, finds the kind of degeneration of course, how he suffers and dies and then reflects uh, on the whole thing, returns back. So it's a kind of journey. It's so pretty well we can uh, really take this kind of, uh, you know, uh, movement of, uh, movement of uh, the whole thing uh, or read the novel as a kind of adventure story because Marlowe makes a journey to Congo, to Africa, the Congo Basin, Congo River and all that. And he finds also the degeneration and the disintegration of European. Now, the point is, as I have already said, that when Marlowe made Skurs, Skurs was uh, quite in his ill health and later on dies. Now, when Marlowe finds, because even before meeting Skurs, Marlowe had uh, heard about Kurtz from different sources, his white counterparts, his people, the Europeans. They are very much afraid of Kurtz and also not just afraid, but also very much, you know, the, the hateful, disdainful towards Kurtz because they fear that Kurtz might take the position, the important position. Uh, so therefore, they are very much uh, hateful, disdainful towards Kurds. So the thing is that this degeneration, this disintegration of Kurds, how to understand it? Is it a story of moral crisis faced, suffered by Kurds? And how does Marlowe react to it? So these are the things, these are the ideas that we should keep in mind while we read the text. So I'm just outlining these areas, uh, you know, and asking the students to keep in mind while reading the text. Now comes the point here. Marlowe undertakes the journey, as I've already said, undertakes the journey and in a very, uh, you know, 
a difficult, arduous, perilous journey from you know Europe to Congo to Africa, uh, which appears to them as a dark place and all that. And then he meets Kurtz, finds because he has already heard the report about Kurtz, how Kurtz actually gets a kind of position and enjoys the power almost becoming like a, a deity, like a god there uh, among the tribals and how this and how and he meets Kurds and later on finds uh, Kurds uh, dying and Kurds made a very, uh, made certain words, uh, you know, said certain words before his death. And that is delivered to us by a tribal uh, boy that Mr. Kurds is dead. Now, then Marlowe, at the end of the story, we find that Marlowe sits uh, like a Buddha in the Buddha like pose. Uh, and he seems to attain certain enlightenment. I'll come to that later. He attains this kind of enlightenment and all that. So, therefore, if it is so, as I've already said, that it can be read as a kind of novel, as a kind of novel, and as a kind of novel of adventure, an adventure story. But the point now that actually should, uh, you know, strike us, the readers, is, is it really mere physical or actual journey? Because of the transformation, because of the changes, uh, the way Marlowe is presented from the very beginning and at the end, when he attempts a Buddha-like pose. Okay, this is how the, you know, story ends, the, you know, narrative ends there that attaining a Buddha-like stance, what does it mean? What, or how could we read these things? I mean, this is how the reader should look into that. Is it a mere physical journey or an actual journey? Uh, yes, obviously an actual journey, but is it like that? Is it something more than that? Is it a metaphoric journey? Is, or is there something like a kind of inner journey or a spiritual journey? Because the image of Buddha is there, certain changes, ideas are there. No, this is how we need to, we need to read the text. Meaning while reading the text, these things come up. Meaning how could we uh, relate the experience, the adventure? Because when Marlowe undertakes the journey, he actually gives us his views of what he looks all around him, the kind of atrocity, the white people's atrocity there, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, plight of the black people and all that. But how does he narrate the story? Is it uh, just what he says there? Or is there something more than that? And then again, these kind of things, degeneration and disintegration of European, in this case, the Kurds and what it could have an impact upon, uh, say, Marlowe himself. We have to look into all these things. So the kind of reading, therefore, will help us to explore the text from different angles. Meaning we can explore the text, we can unravel the text if we just uh, look at the possible uh, interpretations that might come up through our attentive reading. So here comes the uh, you know importance of reading. Uh, with all the attention and the necessary caution. Now, how to read this text, as I have been trying to highlight on, some reading strategies. When we'll be reading the text, we see that uh, there is a narrator narrating the story. There is Marlowe. Marlowe tells his story to others. And there is another person who is also, who is, who is the kind of frame narrator, that are, you know, narrating Marlowe's uh, narration. Now, why this things? I mean, why is not Marlowe given the, uh, you know, freedom to tell his story without having a frame narrator? Is, uh, is there any uh, other possible meaning? Could there be any other possible meaning um, that is there that actually calls for the introduction of a frame narrator? So that is the frame narrator, it is the frame narrator, uh, and Marlowe is narrating his story, there is the frame narrator. What is the purpose? Why Conrad actually, uh, you know, juxtapose these two 
narrators and the possible narration. Now, these are the things that actually concern us, that actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, catches our attention. How to respond to that? How to uh, how to make sense of that? This is what this is the challenge that we have to take in order to unravel the text. Now, if you look at the other things, for example, who are the companions of Marlowe? Okay, uh, does this knowledge, you know, of their identity, the businessman, the accountant, and all that, anything to do with our understanding of the text, the association? And in Marlowe's associates, okay, uh, there, uh, you know, does it have any meaning? Does it have any anything uh, to do with the text, with the furthering of the idea that Condor is uh, trying to suggest or Marlowe is trying to profess? So this is what we need to understand. And as I have already said, Marlowe's Buddha-like pose. And in the very beginning, it has been the narrator, the prime narrator, has been saying that uh, Marlowe uh, is uh, sitting there like a Buddha, you know, after his, uh, you know, perhaps the attainment of some sort of enlightenment through his journey across the seas and all that. So at the very beginning, we find this thing. And again, in the end, we also find Marlowe being depicted as one. Uh, you know, sitting like uh, Buddha contemplating. Uh, now, where from does this contemplation come and this pose? What does it mean? So, these are the things that should also concern us and make us think uh, deeply and, uh, you know, and help us to move beyond the obvious. Okay. So, comes another thing, as I have said, that Marlowe's journey, how to make sense of that? There is that certain general naming of that outer station, then the central station, the inner station, where Marlowe is to meet Kurz, who stays there, you know, near the inner station. Now, this outer station, central station, and the inner station, does it have anything to do with uh, any other possible meaning? Because we must understand that this is a text that is rich with symbols with symbolic significance. So uh, could it have any other possible meaning uh, to it? Now, these are the things that we need to understand. Now, let's move to the next one. Now, Marlowe's narration. This is how we need to understand Marlowe's narration. For example, what was Marlowe talking about narrating while undertaking the journey towards the Congo River, the Congo Basin? He talks about the inhumanity, barbaric condition of the primitive people, the poverty, the emaciated body of the colonized. Now, this is Marlo, what Marlowe talks about. We'll try to discuss the other things there, but this is one thing that we have to keep in mind. So, in that sense, therefore, Marlowe is critical of colonialism or the colonial discourse that actually is responsible for this kind of you know uh, exploitation of these poor people um, you know by these traders by the colonial mercenary and all that now but again we should also be wary of the fact that this criticism of colonialism is undermined by his profession as an agent of the colonial company and his association with Kurds what does it mean? Is Marlowe critical of a particular variety or brand of colonialism that was operating at that time in Africa? Or to put it in other words, was Marlowe a kind of believer in the kind of colonial discourse that was in vogue at that time? That is, for example, the kind of beneficial aspect of this colonialism, the kind of civilizing mission and all that. So was there this kind of dubiousness on the part of Marlowe himself? Was he critical of a particular variety of colonialism that was operative in Africa? Or was he generally 
you know, uh, generally uh, critical of colonialism as such. We'll have to explore these things. Okay, so these are the ideas that you have to keep in mind. Now, as I have said, we need to move beyond this, uh, you know, the obvious things. Then only we'll be able to make an understanding of the possible, ver uh, possible ideas that are actually hidden within the text. That is, now, as I've said, decline and death of Kurtz. As we see at the end, when Marlowe was to meet Kurtz, uh, and Kurtz was in poor health, and uh, after meeting, uh, you know, Marlowe and exchanging and, you know, just uh, giving certain things, I mean, documents and all that, we find that Kurtz actually uh, dies and his body was buried, etc. So how to therefore look at this thing? This is, one might argue, this integration of a European mind who is, you know, displaced from his own locality, from his own habitat into a uh, completely different, uh, maybe, you know, sociologically, socially, uh, than uh, we might say, uh, in other areas, in different alien environments, marked by barbarism, primitivism, so all these things. So is it that this integration of a European mind, which is supposed to be marked by logic, rationality, discipline, civilized thinking, etc. So this very trans, this very, you know, displacement itself creates a kind of disintegration in uh, you know, in Kurds. This is how we can uh, approach this uh, text. Uh, this sounds a little bit uh, okay. This quite is. This is quite fair. Yes, one who is uh, you know displaced from his locality, from his habitat, and is given a kind of free uh, you know space and free uh, you know uh, thinking and doing on his own without any restraint and all that. Uh, may turn out, may disintegrate and degenerate, and ultimately may face the kind of uh, you know, and the problem that is actually faced by Kurds. This could happen. This is how we can uh, approach, we can look at it, but it has problems. We could argue in that way, but up to a very limited extent. Why limited? We'll be discussing. Why this kind of uh, argument does not hold water? Uh, in the long run, we'll be uh, talking about that, but one could fairly come up, now this was the kind of basic, uh, you know, reading uh, in the Europeans, uh, by the European readers who uh, thought that there was nothing uh, like what has been talked about this text, uh, say race, race relationship, uh, colonialism, blah, blah, blah. No, they tried to look at it uh, from this point of view, that how the European mind degenerates, how the European mind uh, you know, disintegrates because one is displaced and, and is inserted into an environment that is hostile. That sounds hostile, that sounds uh, quite hostile to that person, okay? So therefore, this is one aspect that you have to keep in mind. So course was, or could it be like this, Kurz was appropriated by colonial machinery or system. Uh, degenerates, that is a necessary fallout of the dehumanizing aspect of colonialism based on racial binary. I'll be talking about that. That is reflected because you see, at the end, at the end, when Kurz was on his deathbed, Kurz made the, you know, just said certain things, which was actually. Uh, you know, reported to us by a, a tribal person, boy, that Mr. Kurtz is dead. This is what he said. But before his death, Kurtz said two words: "The horror, the horror." Now the thing is that uh, how can we interpret these two words: "The horror, the horror," or what could possibly be the meaning of these words? This is it uh, an acknowledgement of certain things? Is it uh, a confession? Is it an acknowledgement? Is it an indictment? It is a reaction on the part of Kurz. So what is it? How to interpret that? On one point, we might say, we really know nothing. 
uh, because we don't have an idea of what Kurt was actually uh, trying to say through these words. We don't have any idea. But from the other, uh, you know, inf other references and uh, I and symbols and other, uh, you know, uh, clues, we can come to certain uh, inferences. Okay, later to. Uh, understand the possible implication of these words, the horror, the horror. I'll be trying to explore that a little later. But for the time being, let us try to uh, understand this basic thing that uh, uh, that this very idea, uh, the horror, the horror, problematizes uh, the uh, earlier reading that uh, this disintegration of Kurt was uh, primarily the result of his displacement from his own environment and was uh, and because of his insertion into a radically different uh, hostile environment uh, and uh, all that okay so uh, we'll be uh, talking about that now how to uh, how to look at this uh, look at the success story and the decline of Mr. Kurt, because we must understand that in this text, two important characters are obviously there. One is Mr. Kurt, another is Marlowe. It was about Marlowe's, uh, meaning it was actually uh, the story is told from the perspective of Marlowe, but not exactly from Marlowe, because there was the frame narrator who actually presents that and allows Marlowe to narrate his story. So, what I'm trying to suggest here is that. Marlowe undertakes the journey, meets uh, this uh, uh, person uh, who is a merchant of uh, this ivory and all that. So, uh, therefore, how, uh, meaning these are two important characters. So, Marlowe's journey, Marlowe uh, narrates the story, meets curves, and uh, certain things happen. So, we might consider it as a kind of philosophical, uh, psychological, you know, the journey undertaken by Marlowe. That is one part. But one important character, obviously, is Mr. Kurtz. Now, how so do we read Mr. Kurtz, his life, and all that? So the questions, therefore, come, meaning because there was not much action there, so far as Kurtz is concerned, because we uh, have heard about Kurtz, meaning as Marlowe has heard about Kurtz from different sources, and he wants to meet Kurtz. Uh, and all that. Uh, and later on, he just meets Kurtz, and then uh, after a few uh, exchanges, then Kurtz dies, and all that. Okay. So the point is, therefore, how to read Kurtz, because Kurtz is an important character, and understanding of Kurtz will help us to know the text better. How to read that? Did Kurtz really believe in a colonial discourse that talks about the civilizing mission? Did Kurtz really believe in the colonial discourse that talks about the civilizing mission? In one occasion, Kurtz actually was uh, talking about the thing that in every station there should be a kind of beacon of light, uh, because uh, this is what he says, that yes, uh, the, our enterprise is obviously about trade and uh, all that, but at the same time, it should have uh, certain uh, other things. I mean, it's not just uh, this kind of, you know, um, this kind of, uh, I would say, uh, trade and this kind of thing, but it is more than that. This is how Marlowe, uh, sorry, how Kurt was looking at that. So this idea was there. So the second question is Did Kurt get entrapped by the necessary evil mechanism of colonial enterprise in the course of his stay in Africa? So one perspective. One question is that Kurz might have believed in the true sense or might have believed really in the very civilizing mission of the colonial discourse, the metropolitan colonial discourse, that it has a, uh, it has a civilizing goal, uh, the kind of, you know, the, the kind of sacred duty of the white people to uh, help the blacks and the, you know, uncivilized, unenlightened people to come to terms with that, to know the fruits of the civilization, the greater civilization of the Western uh, countries, Western people, and all that. So this is one aspect. 
so who believed in that this is one and the second question is did kurs get any trapped by necessarily evil mechanism of colonial enterprise in the course of his stay in africa because because kurs might have believed in that this is one but it has certain necessarily necessary evil uh, of this colonial enterprise that might have got you know greater hold on kurs and that resulted in his disintegration this you know degeneration and the subsequent you know death and all that and here comes this word that i was trying to talk about that is this thing that uh, you know the horror the horror okay uh, so it says that how to read that is it a reflection on an acknowledgement of his own action in africa what he did with the native people meaning his relentless pursuit of ivory his exploitation his complete you know uh, his exploitation of the poor people and all that or is it his acknowledgement of the abominable nature of the colonial enterprise itself or is it both so how to respond to that was the term the horror the horror are uh, applicable to the fact that coach was at the end of his life on his deathbed he comes to know about his own involvement own implicit involvement in action in what happened in africa or is it just is it an acknowledgement of the fearful abominable detestable uh, aspect of the colonial uh, enterprise colonial discourse itself or is it a both yes as i was saying that kurtz uh, you know uh, regarding kurtz's belief in the uh, uh, belief in the kind of you know uh, the civilizing mission kurtz at one point as it was there one point in chapter 2 says each station should be like a beacon on the road towards better things a center humanizing improving instructing so this is how coach was looking at that so this is what he said meaning uh, yes it involved or it is all about trade business etc but it is also about these things this humanizing improving and instructing but then what happened to kurds why this kind of changes is it because that he realized certain other things or is it because whether he likes it or not he had to be you know uh, handled and ultimately uh, uh, you know mishandled by the colonial uh, discourse itself colonial enterprise itself one may refer to for example uh, you know a passage to india where uh, we see the indians talk about uh, uh, roni the magistrate there and hamidul le and other indians they are talking about roni that they say that this this red nosed boy uh, was quite good when he came here for the first time but he ha- but others have uh, others meaning other white people have got hold of him meaning that these people come there with good intention perhaps Uh, but they are ultimately caught by the greater mechanism uh, within which they have to operate so this is what happens and adela we also see how adela was uh, was gradually you know distancing herself from uh, you know ronnie because uh, he finds that ronnie has become uh, quite uh, you know uh, uh, quite uh, different from what uh, she has actually known ronnie Uh, for years earlier in their oxford days and all that so is it, so this has to do with the colonial uh, uh, mechanism itself colonial enterprise itself it is necessarily uh, a kind of evil that will lead to the, this kind of degeneration and all that i'm just asking you to keep in mind these things uh, uh, let's move on now the point is that uh, we are talking about africa the congo Uh, now the heart of darkness uh, because it is considered to be a dark place so it is the heart that is the center center of darkness in this uh, place now uh, let's uh, how this heart of darkness is present presented in the text how marlow talks about these uh, things this is what we need to understand that is 
Congo or Africa is mapped in the novella as a dark place. Blank, you know, what Marlowe says, there's a blank space there. Uh, now, the thing is that this is a story of a few Europeans journey to Congo, distant place mapped by foreigners. What does it mean? Now, what I'm trying to suggest here is that how these foreign locales, these foreign places are all, you know, all presented to us only through the perspective of these white people. Okay, so this is how the heart of darkness here, Congo, the Congo Basin and all that actually mapped by the foreigners, by the uh, Western uh, people. You know, here comes the uh, idea of Orientalism and all that, okay? So just keep in mind this uh, particular idea. Now, the thing is that this is the space imagined by a particular set of people and enlivened to us a reader through the narration. How the narration actually attests to and amplifies this idea of, uh, of this, uh, this space, this particular space as it was understood by these uh, people by these white Europeans and how they actually narrate the story. Now, the moment we say these things, there comes a question. There comes a question. The question is, no counterpoint is given in that narration. What does it mean? That is, that we know all about, say, Africa. We know all about the uh, Congo. We all know about these uh, black people. Uh, uh, these emaciated bodies, the black people, the poverty stricken people, uh, their bigger ways of life and all that, only through the narration of Marlowe, that is the European. So there is no place for any counterpoint to, uh, to what Marlowe was actually saying or what Marlowe was narrating. I mean, we don't have the perspective of of uh, perspective of say the other perspective of uh, of Africa, meaning uh, how to know it uh, from their point of view. There is no such thing. That's why an image of Africa is created through the narration. So the narration attests to and helps in creating this particular aspect of uh, uh, of uh, this Africa and present it to us. And that is the reason why we find that uh, Africa is presented as a mere background. So it's, a, it's a jungle, uh, the people with uh, bigger habits, their customs, and all that, as if that they are uh, like animals. And we see that uh, uh, these poor people very often were actually, uh, you know, compared to ants and others and all these things. So therefore, Africa is presented as a mere background. Now, when we read this text, we now have to uh, know about these things. That why? Because we see that all these things actually happen in a space uh, we come to know uh, uh, as uh, Congo Basin or this Africa and on this continent as Africa. Uh, then the question that should automatically come about us is that this is all about these people, uh, though it is about Kurs uh, disintegration and Marlowe has come to know about Kurs and to uh, retrieve him and all that. Uh, so it's about Europeans, yes, no doubt about that, European journey and all that Marlowe's journey. But the point is, the point is it all takes place in uh, Africa or in the Congo Basin, but we don't get in any idea of their point of view, their ideas. Now, how to understand this, how to make sense of this, I meaning while we read the text, while we read the text, this comes to our mind that uh, how should we therefore look at it? Uh, one might say, well, um, why to look at uh, these things from that point of view? Because it's just a background. It's just a background. Uh, well, it's a background, but the thing is that it's uh, not background. It's not just a background. And this is where we will see later on, Chinu actually intervenes. There why background? Now, this is, uh, I'll be talking about it later in the next slide. 
But what I am trying to suggest here is that while we go on reading, these things keep on coming. That how to uh, how to read this uh, text, how to uh, read these movements. So Africa is presented as a mere background. Okay, so uh, uh, yes, yes. So uh, now when you read the heart of darkness, when you talk about heart of darkness today, or uh, contemporary times, we cannot but refer it back to Chinu Atibi uh, and his uh, intervention, because that has actually marked a different uh, reading of the text. We have been reading the traditional, we have been, uh, you know, uh, familiar with the traditional reading, the Marlowe's journey, uh, Marlowe's uh, indictment of colonialism, because yes, we see that uh, Mm, Marlowe talks about the, you know, the kind of uh, problems, the kind of brutality uh, faced by the, uh, suffered by the, uh, you know, uh, by the poor people, by the blacks and all that in the hand of the uh, whites, how the whites are merciless uh, in their dealing with uh, their own, the, the people who have been recruited there and all that. So there was a reference to railway station and the work was going on and how the poor people were, uh, you know, were working there, they remain half paid and all that. And Marlu was uh, very, very uh, struck by this incident, by this, uh, you know, uh, by this particular aspect. And we obviously see how Marlu was actually talking about the kind of inhuman uh, atrocity that was actually hard against the, uh, you know, uh, poor people, the black people and all that. So the point is that we have been reading in this way uh, that Marlowe indicts the uh, colonialism, but uh, uh, to a certain extent, and that is where the necessity of a, a frame narrator comes in. Uh, because is it necessarily the story of Marlowe? Is it necessarily the story of Conrad? What is the possible relation between the two? Uh, how does Conrad intervene? So all these questions come. So my point is here that uh, uh, that Chinu HEB comes and he has his own way of looking at things. And before uh, you know, talking about this uh, particular uh, critical intervention made by Chinu HEB, uh, we know that in his uh, you know right uh, in his critical essay that is an image of Africa, racism in corners, heart of darkness. In his very uh, critical essay, he begins with an uh, anecdote, with a story, uh, with a, just a kind of story uh, where he, uh, you know, talks about two incidents, two things while he was coming from his university. And he finds uh, that one, uh, you know, person of his age was just uh, trying, was, uh, you know, uh, trying to be familiar with uh, Chinu HB and say that uh, was he a student there? And the Chinu HB said that no, 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 I was just uh, teaching their African uh, literature. Now that struck that person because uh, meaning something that surprised him, Africa and then African literature. Okay, I'll be coming to you one day perhaps. This is how he, in a very jocular way, said to this person. This is one aspect that Chinuachi refers to. Those who have read the essay, they obviously know it. Uh, for those who have not read it, I'm just rephrasing it in a uh, brief way. And the second thing is that uh, he talks about the high school students who actually sent letters to Chinuachi by saying that they have just read uh, Things Fall Apart, Chinuachi's book, novel, Things Fall Apart, and it is uh, interesting. It is uh, very good. They were very happy. But they were happy because they came to know about the superstition, the bizarre lifestyle of a tribe uh, in Africa. So these are the things that, uh, you know, and, uh, with which Chinu HB actually begins his scathing attack upon Conrad. And in the course of his essay, because of the lack of time, I will not be going in detail, but just will be uh, touching upon certain points. So Conrad uh, talked about, uh, sorry, 
uh, Junior ITB uh, then you know makes a scathing uh, attack in the sense that he tries to uh, question the way uh, Aftika is present and dead in that particular text, A Heart of Darkness, and calls Conrad a thoroughgoing racist. Okay, why racist? He gives certain um, uh, you know examples, uh, certain ideas. Uh, it's a very interesting essay. And then he talks about uh, these things. He says that it is because, for example, can speak to his absence of our chicken voice. One interesting thing is that in Heart of Darkness, though it is uh, about uh, the white people, their way of looking at the things, but in a particular place that is Africa or Congo Basin, but we don't have the voice of these people of the Africa. So the moment you just withhold the voice from these people, uh, uh, then it actually suggests that these people are not to be uh, represented in that sense. There is the problem of this representation. They should not be uh, given any voice when you do not know any perspective from, uh, from them. It's not just a kind of way of withholding voice because they, uh, because you know, the, uh, the idea is that uh, you don't consider them worth of uh, being heard or worth of, worthy of uh, talking about themselves. So this is how as Shinya TV says, dehumanizing the space takes place, robbing the people of its history, culture, language, etc. Yes, your language, your history could be different from that of others. That's a that's a, a different thing, but uh, it does not mean that you should not represent them. So then Merlo uh, enjoying Connor's con complete confidence. This is what Shinya TV says. That complete confidence. Why? Because uh, because of the kind of profession of these two people. Marlow uh, was a, a seaman uh, navigating in the seas, and Connor himself was also a navigator. So this has a very close relation between the two. I mean, in one sense, Marlow could be the pixel representation of Connor, as we knew as we try, was trying to suggest. And another important thing that Chinu Achibi says there is the very fact that uh, that this heart of darkness, this text, attends and enjoys the status of a canonical text. This is where, you know, this is where Achibi was, uh, you know, was very much troubled with. Why? Because Chinu Achibi's point is that, that there are other books that depict Aptika in different light, in say, let us say, bad light. Okay. But what troubles Junior TB with Conrad's presentation of Aptika in Heart of Darkness is that this particular text enjoys the canonical text. Why can why this kind of problem with this canonization in that sense, with this canonical status of this text? This is particularly because uh, as Junior HEV unfolds, there is that it can set the mind of young people. You know, the young graduates and all that in a negative way about Africa. So in a, and that's why Junior HEV in that essay says that, so do you call this Heart of Darkness as a great work of art, work of art? Junior HEV is firm and unambiguous reply was no, it cannot be. Because you just can't, you know, with Ari, the people, dehumanizing them, you know, giving no voice to these people and art that does all these things cannot be considered as, or cannot be celebrated as a great work of art. This is how Chinu Achibi actually was finding fault with that. And Chinu Achibi also unfolds how uh, Marlowe, uh, or let us say uh, Conrad, was so much you know, in love, or perhaps in obsession, with the idea of blackness. And in different descriptions, we see how Conrad seems to be fascinated by the very idea of black, and he describes blackness as a complete antithetical to the idea of whiteness, and he refers to different, uh, you know, 
Marlow, sorry, Connors letters and suggesting how the white people, their, uh, you know, ivory like, you know, skin and body, etc., actually stands for something majestic against which the poor, the black Africans, their life is presented. So, what Chinese FGV was trying to suggest that it actually suggests Connors' own implicit, uh, you know, uh, involvement in the whole project. Uh, and that is why he says that Marlowe enjoys Connors' complete confidence in the way these people were actually uh, depicted, Aptika was depicted. Because you see that when the novel begins, we see Marlowe was moving towards the Front River, and you find that he was moving to a time, the prehistoric time, primitive time, so when there was, uh, you know, uh, no human being actually set foot on this uh, on this space. This is how Africa is uh, present, dead in that particular uh, text, Out of Darkness. This is where we need we need what Edward says suggests a kind of contrapuntal reading. Contrapuntal is the term that Edward says actually uses in his book uh, Culture and Imperialism, right? He actually gets the idea from music where it suggests that you need uh, to have a kind of counterpoint uh, to the kind of harmony that is actually present in uh, music. And the counterpoint will help you to increase your idea. Now, uh, and he refers to, uh, you know, Mansfield Park, uh, that novel, and shows how the very reference to the sugarcane uh, in Antigua and, uh, and this colonial outposts. That has actually helped in pumping the British economy and helped in, for example, in offering the colonial privileges, the privileges that the colonial masters actually enjoy. So these privileges that the colonial masters enjoy, for example, the kind of uh, the fine things, the ivory, the fine things, the uh, furniture, the kind of you know luxury, uh, that these colonial masters enjoy at home uh, were actually financed by uh, these, uh, by the slaves, uh, by the, uh, you know, there is poor people working in the different areas. So the, the point that Edward Said was actually, Said was trying to say is that we need to look at these gaps as these features at this way to make sense of or to, uh, to, to you know, counteract the kind of traditional reading. That is, this traditional reading of a text can be set off by this kind of reading. And this is, uh, this is uh, what we need to do in Heart of Darkness. That, yes, we understand that Marlowe is uh, sympathetic towards the, the poor people, uh, to the black, black people. Uh, he is critical. Uh, you know, he is, uh, you know, carping at the very, you know, at the very atrocity, the brutality of his own fellow people, that is uh, the white people. But at the same time, this is a traditional reading. We need to go beyond that, go beyond that to see uh, the other possible meanings as Junior TV uh, actually did in that uh, very incisive, uh, you know, essay on Heart of Darkness. So this is where a kind of alternative reading comes, and we need to uh, need to look for these features. Look for the meaning why there was the reference to nigger, the black, and all these things so often in the description of these uh, African people, and why there was no voice. Uh, no, only Mr. Coors he dared these things said, and at another time, one uh, a tribal person saying certain things though the kind of dialects, only not the full fledged language, and most importantly, only a few words to give a kind of balanced point that this is what the African people are all capable of. So you are just withholding the speech, the voice to these people. Now, this will help us to, uh, to, to move beyond the ordinary and to explore it. So this is the thing. I'll be uh, very brief and shortly move over. And another thing that you notice in Heart of Darkness is how the world, how the novel actually uh, operates and moves through a, an idea of juxtaposition. 
juxtaposition of the opposite for example there is a the reference to london uh, uh, sorry uh, you know london and yes london and congo river there is a congo basin in africa then the thames reference to the mighty thames and the thames and these also had the experience of the darkness of the previous time thames and then the congo then we also have kurs intended okay the kurs fiance who was waiting in europe and uh, uh, who was waiting in europe and then uh, waiting for kurs and he and she comes to know that kurs is dead and marlo comes later and kurs intended was actually asking from marlo uh, what did or what did kurs say about me or what was kurs's last words what was kurs's last last words and then uh, then you know uh, then kurs uh, sorry then marlo said uh, that uh, it was your name okay now what we need to understand this thing we need to understand this thing that is uh, uh, marlo who has said throughout the novel that he detests lying he detests telling lies he detests lies it is abominable for him and he ultimately uh, you know tells a lie to curses intended and then in that very description there was a match you know curs uh, talks about uh, yes i am just uh, reading a line only i will not take much time it is already like so i pulled myself together and spoke slowly the last word he pronounced was your name okay and then the lady said i knew it i was sure he was she knew she was sure i heard her weeping she had hidden her face in her hands it seemed to me that the house would collapse before i could escape uh, etc etc so the point is that um, uh, the point is that uh, so there was this uh, curses intended on the one end who is capable of uh, um, you know capable of having a uh, matured uh, fidelity and all that and there was one amazonian uh, woman amazonian woman there uh, uh, and the way uh, you know that is being uh, narrated is uh, is uh, interesting uh, uh, because that woman is associated with something primeval force and uh, power and all these things and uh, the kind of mystery and all that so there was this kind of you know the kind of uh, you know juxtaposition of these two curse intended an amazonian woman so the europeans and the africans and naturally we should therefore in that sense we should read heart of darkness alongside things fall apart it is a novel that gives us an idea the perspective of uh, perspective of uh, the africans there uh, it's about the a particular tribe and the onset of christianity and the colonialism in africa uh, uh, and it's a story of okonoko's you know a uh, struggle and other things so it's uh, the kind of uh, uh, the way th that we should juxtapose this reading meaning the idea is that uh, we need to read uh, these uh, two texts together as a way of uh, knowing about colonialism and all that okay so so the novel therefore in that sense becomes more of a kind of it's not about the heart of darkness it becomes more about the darkness of art okay so uh, since it becomes quite uh, late so like uh, this this is what i just uh, tried to uh, look at the whole thing in this way uh, so that students may approach the text in that way or there are other possible ways also so i'll be happy if you just uh, uh, you know mail at mail at sukanto3 at the red gmail.com for any comments suggestions or feedback so Uh, so thank you very much for giving a patient hearing thank you thank you dr shukant das actually must give it has taken place regarding the possible ways of reading such a great book such a great novel like heart of darkness and after shukanto and his speech i have been simply stunned and deeply moved and such is the condition of our listeners also 
cold rains once said what comes from the heart goes to the heart just happens here and there it is a presentation from the heart and it touches all the hearts here and it is the heart of darkness and final resolution was it is the darkness of heart and it was and it is the fact that uh, the colonial impact has been quite explicit here and as sukanto already exposed uh, actually the novel and narrates the story of marlo's job as a ivory transporter down to the city of congo so through his journey marlo develops an intense interest in investigating cards an ivory procured agent and marlo is shocked upon seeing what european traders have done to the natives it is almost an eternal truth that the european people very seldom very seldom took the africans as their own and this sense of colonization and the post colonial aspect have been explicit and already there are so many questions so many askings and most of them in favor of the beautiful presentation of shukanto babu that is our tapos bishas commented very informative sir shayan sutra dhar such a beautiful explanation and experience also and shayan sutra dhar was immediately supported by learn with smile i don't know his name and our raja boshu so probing unpacking the multiple and and multiple key of text thoroughly enjoyed the session our principal sir really excellent presentation and exposition these are the immediate and our dr ata mollik enlightened speech thank you dr shukant das chandan thank Vishash. you very much it's a pleasure <laughs> right <laughs> isha vishash absolutely wonderful session sir these are the compliments from the listeners immediately and as shukanto trusted you rakesh does the matter give some messages to the death of mr coots shukanto you have to please well uh, well i i repeat uh, does uh, the narrator give some messages yes. on the death of mr coots well uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the question is does the narrator give some message on the date of uh, mr kurs now uh, not exactly um, in that sense but uh, two things that i can say i will take only two minutes uh, don't worry it is already late the thing is that one thing is that uh, you know when the narrator you know moves back uh, there moves moves back and meets uh, you know kurs's intended we find that he tells a lie and as i have said that marlo detests telling lies now why did he tell the lie this is a saving illusion meaning an illusion is needed that lie is the kind of saving lie meaning it can save maybe perhaps conrad tries to suggest is that the world in which we live is so full of uh, so full of gruesome realities uh, uh, some you know unwanted and very pathetic reality is that it is at times uh, necessary that we should have a kind of uh, illusion that might help us to cope with the uh, with the trying time with the trying situation uh, it's it's almost like uh, you know the kind of illusion things so that will not be comparable almost like you know we are waiting for the vaccination uh, for our covid Uh, 19 and we hope that it will be say uh, out by uh, december and then uh, you know january something like that so the point is that uh, this is something that uh, marlo tells and at the end the narrator says marlo attends a kind of buddha like pose the kind of enlightenment you know what is this enlightenment 
Merlin knows about the about Cursus' life, his struggle, his uh, his you know treatment of the uh, poor black people, the kind of uh, unrestrained power and the position being colonial master that he enjoys. Uh, and at the very gate or entrance of his heart, uh, we see the you know the kind of beheaded uh, you know the you know, cut of heads are uh, just put there you know to tighten the tribal people that he enjoys the power he is the lord there he is the he is the uh, almost a kind of god there so that is the kind of status that he enjoys and marlo comes to know all these things and he perhaps undergoes this uh, idea this uh, these things and maybe uh, maybe marlo reflects perhaps uh, that uh, it's not the place that is uh, dark, but it may be the heart that is full of darkness. This idea could be there, but we really do not know what happens. But uh, we do know that Marlowe attempts this kind of pose. Uh, this is what uh, Conrad actually says. But again, after Tinuati's intervention, we cannot come to any exact conclusion. Uh, this could be a pose on the part of uh, Conrad himself, because you never know Conrad did not attend the kind of British citizenship, British citizenship when point. He actually wrote this particular text, so so he should not be too uh, indicting the uh, colonial enterprise as such. He still looks upon it as something good, something civilizing. Maybe that kind of particular brand of uh, colonialism uh, operative in Africa perhaps is not, uh, uh, you know, as good as it is as it should be. Something like that. This is my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. What do you? In the Adi. meantime, ah, please. In the meantime, uh, a few more comments have already arrived here. Our Kishore Das. Uh, before that, I would uh, just uh, say on your opinion would be recorded and your opinion would be echoed through our uh, final speech, please. Kishore Das said. Uh, incomparable analysis, sir. Thank you so much. We want you to join us again later, mm -hmm. sir. Kishore Das, our fifth sem student. Shumana Mondol, such a wonderful session. And we are in this also. Thank you very much, sir. Omrita Talukdar, wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, these are the immediate reaction from our audience. Audience, I would say. Well, uh, uh, Adir, uh, sorry for interrupting. English pronunciation is so attractive. All right. Uh, Adir, I'm uh, sorry for yes, interrupting. I Chukanto? just um, want to know. Yes. yes, if there is any question, you please just uh, uh, pass it on to me. Otherwise, you know, narrating all these things is embarrassing for me, one. And secondly, uh, since we are almost <laughs> uh, at the, the dinner time, it may not, meaning we should not actually uh, drag these people and retain <laughs> them for so long. Okay, so no, 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 no. That's, so that's my pleasure. Please, 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 please. All right. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, please uh, carry on. Uh, from the anchor's point of view, I would just uh, accord myself with uh, Chino Asibi's comment. Marlowe enjoying Conrad's complete confidence. This is the impression there. Right, sir, and thank you. So I have been simply sound and deeply moved. Dr. Shukanto, your speech makes us almost motionless. And as I saw, some opinions from the listeners, and they have already shared their views. And on behalf of Shukanto Das, also, I would uh, urge them to pass their questions if they have any to the to the contact number rather uh, to the email of Shukantu Das. I will serve you letters. Okay. And uh, presently I would like to ask or I would like to request rather our Chandan Babu to give the feedback link please. And uh, while uh, the feedback link will be filled up by the particip participants and it is time to record our, to continue our vote of thanks. And to do so, I would uh, invite Rakesh Shakar once again for the vote of thanks.
and uh, from our core of heart uh, thanks sukanto babu and uh, uh, the last word will be said by our principal sir also but from me it is okay and we have been simply sand and deeply moved as i have already mentioned earlier and now it is time for vote of thanks and rakesh sarkar is waiting for adhir babu there adhir babu there is a question from kishore kishore sorry sir yeah. right there is a question from kishore in chat box right right right, right. okay yes, okay yes. i have got it i have got it sukanto please uh, sir yes yes i saw it we know right. that joseph conta spent the next part of his life sailing all over the world that why can we say that he presented this novel to us as a part of his sailor life sir Uh, well well so obviously continue. because you see that this but yes thank you this particular text heart of darkness actually originated from uh, conrad's own experience as a sailor and that is the reason why chinuati we says that marlo enjoys conrad's uh, you know uh, complete confidence, confidence because <laughs> uh, marlo actually uh, was a sailor there in that particular text um, uh, this heart of darkness and in other novels also and conrad himself was a sailor too so therefore uh, genuine this leads genuity we to conclude the uh, safely perhaps that uh, you know marlo enjoys uh, conrad's confidence which means that uh, marlo uh, you know conrad actually attests to what uh, marlo has been saying in that very text uh, yes obviously Uh, you know the life that uh, Conrad spent and uh, as a sailor that has uh, actually gone into the making of this sort of darkness. Yes, right, right. Uh, Kishore, perhaps you got your answer. And uh, if you know what is, I will just add a sentence or two. Actually, Conrad joined the British yeah. Marine Navy and was naturalized as a British citizen in nineteen eighty sorry nineteen eighty six and later. But twenty years was there in the service. Okay, so and with this thought, we would uh, like to import our thoughts. The both thanks, and it is uh, for Rakesh Sarkar to do the job. Is Rakesh Sarkar with a vote of thanks? Rakesh Sarkar. Thank you, sir. on behalf of the department of english i heartful my heartful thanks to dr shukanto dash our honorable special speaker on problematizing reading in conrad's heart of darkness sir you have shared your valuable time and information to enlighten and enrich us we are really grateful to you thank you sir again i would like to thank our mentor and pioneer honorable principal sir dr chitranjan das i also thank our honorable iqac coordinator dr ata mollik i thank professor adhir roy head of the department of english to guide and instruct me to play a little role in this valuable webinar i also thank mr tapash bishwas to help us and arrange the webinar we are really grateful to professor chandan bishwas and professor koshik shaw we could not arrange this webinar without your technical support and advice thank you for your helping hands once again thank you all the other staff participants listeners and dear students have a wonderful evening thank you everyone thank you rakesh adhir babu